Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, for being here today. I'm Neil Romanowski. I'm the Dean of University Libraries. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the Graduate Research Series, uh, which is collaboratively hosted by University Libraries, Graduate Student Senate, and Faculty Senate. This series celebrates and illuminates the research process of graduate students um, and we hear them share their research and the various successes and challenges and discoveries that they encountered in that process. So this afternoon, I'm delighted to introduce um, Ivan Mosley, who will be speaking about his research, How to Be Good in Black, The Legacy of the Black Codes. Uh, Ivan is currently working towards a Master of Fine Arts in Playwriting and a Master of Arts Administration here at Ohio University. He has a Bachelor of Arts in Theater from Wake Forest University and is an alumnus of the Kennedy Center excuse me, Kennedy Center Playwriting Intensive and the Advanced Playwriting Program at the National Theater Institute. In 2018, his play Evelyn and His Brothers was selected as a semifinalist for the Bay Area Playwrights Festival. So without further ado, please help me in giving a warm welcome to Ivan. Over and to hey, you, all Ivan. The rest, and hey, all, all the rest of you that I did not say hi to. Um, uh, Thank you for being here. You could, you could be anywhere else in the world, but, and, but I appreciate your presence that you're here. Um, so guys, we are, are going to start, start my presentation. I'm gonna share my screen with you guys. And just give, give like a thumbs up or anything if, if you can see it. Yep, we can see it. Cool. All right then. All right, so we're gonna start from the beginning. All right, so this, this is my, my presentation, How to Be Good in Black, The Legacy of the Black Codes. And so the focus of my, my presentation today is the Black Codes of the 19th century. And so the Black Codes were laws that regulated free Black labor in the, in the late 19th century. Um, the research, my research question is, how do the Black Codes transform to affect African Americans today? And so the significance of the Black Codes is that they they do, through my research, I found that they do still affect African Americans in some form today because they just transformed. They they were repealed, but there were, were laws that went in their place. And so you have th things like um, the, the war on crime and the war on um, war on drugs that, that just took their place. And so my research, um, I find it important because this research builds on the work of such African American intellectuals as W. E. B. Du Bois. Okay, and then we're going in, into my presentation content. So um, first we're going to go into my library resources, and then we're going to go into what inspired me to look at the Black Codes and what inspired me to write this play in general. And then we're going to go into my initial research, and then I'm going to give you guys some background information on the Black Codes, and then I'm, I'm going to go into um, commonalities within the Black Codes, and I'm going to then I'm going to move on to the effects of the Black Codes in the past and the present, and then I'm going to end with how this relates to my play. So my library resources. So. Um, Shout out to Lorraine Wokner. She has been a big help. Um, she is the subject librarian for the theater um, and performing arts. And she also serves as the subject librarian for African American studies. So during our many meetings, um, we use the search terms Negro, heteronormative, black, colored, masculine, feminine, labor, laws, wage, and work. And it led to, to so many other things. Um, it, it, it was just, just like, as, as soon as you, you um, searched one thing, it led to something else and it led to something else. And it, it was just a, spider web of research that we found. Um, so I, I visited the following databases. So like the Oxford African American uh, Study Center, uh, Gender Watch, ProQuest, JSTOR, the Journal of Homosexuality, Alice, Articles Plus, Hate in America, and Hine Online. Um, so the mo one of the most useful was the Oxford um, African American Study Center because that um, documented American uh, African American history from the 16th century to the present. Uh, also, um, Alice and Articles Plus 
and JSTOR and Procrest were very helpful. And uh, Lorraine also directed me to uh, national organizations such as the National Bureau of Economic Research uh, and the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. And we also used ebooks. So what was the inspiration for this play? So as a queer African-American person, I know firsthand that there is a link between queerness and blackness. And not only that, my mother and her siblings worked as sharecroppers in the 1960s and 70s. I hear so many sto stories of um, how her, her fingers um, got ants in them um, when she was twining tobacco or she was uh, um, twirling cotton and she was putting it up in the pack house. Um, later and later in, and in the day about dusk. Um, so with with slavery as my heritage, because sharecropping can be seen as a no, another form of slavery, and I'm going to explain to you um, why later in the um, in in the presentation. But but yeah, so sl with slavery as a part of my heritage and uh, uh, with the queer experience as part of my heritage as well, I wanted to write a play that connected the modern African-American experience to that of the 1860s. And I thought the best way to do that would be the Black Codes. Um, like, like I said, the Black Codes regulated um, African-American free labor in, in the 1860s, but they, they also changed to um, regu regulate um, Black folks and their autonomy through the present day. So my initial research. So um, I met with Dr. Bayina Jeffries, chair of the African American Studies Department. Shout out if you are here. Um, then um, I met, she um, directed me to Lorraine. And then we started with the, Af the Oxford African American Studies Center. And then we found excerpts from the Black Codes in multiple states, such as South Carolina, North Carolina, Mississippi, and Ohio, because people often think that um, the Black Codes just um, were related to, to the South, but no, um, Ohio had some as well. And also, incidentally, these are all places that I've lived. And so let me give you so, some, some background information on the Black Codes. So after the Civil War, there are four million free black men and women as a result of the passing of the 13th Amendment, which outlaws slavery. There's a loophole in, in, in that um, amendment, but we'll talk about that later. So the so Southern economy after the Civil War was decimated because it mostly depended on an agricultural uh, economy and the agricultural economy depended on enslaved black labor. And white people at this time um, were insulted because Black people, they didn't have to stay on their property anymore. They could just, just walk away. And so as a result, um, white people believed like black people were lazy and they, they needed proper motivation to work. Thus, the Black Codes were passed between 1865 and 1866. They were later repealed. However, they were replaced with Jim Crow laws in the late 19th century and in the early 20th century. So now, now we're going to see some of the commonalities of the Black Codes. Black people had to have employment, but there are rules to that employment. So your employment had to be through a white man, first, first and foremost, and, and you had to renew those contracts yearly. You could not terminate the contracts and Black people could work for themselves, but they had to have a court approved license and there could be anywhere from 10 to a hundred dollars and um if you adjust that for inflation today so ten dollars would be like 170 dollars um and and 168 dollars would be about 1700 dollars so um i don't have that kind of money my line around um it's a pandemic um but but Black people at that time certainly didn't ha have that kind of money around because because they 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 did didn't have jobs uh, as a result of slavery yet. Um, so um, failure to provide proof of employment led to a vagrancy charge and imprisonment. And, and so what happened was you, you had to have um, 
um, proof of employment from, from your employer. Um, so, so you had to have written proof. Um, and one, once they, they imprisoned you, you, you could you went to prison and they could also um, lease you out to other in, um, plantation owners and other businessmen. Um, and then, then we see um, we see see um, the the uh, the proliferation of slavery once again because of the master was known as the employer and the employee was known as the servant. So so all these these through the rules and through the titles, we're starting to see um, a return back to slavery again in in form, if not name. And so now I'm going to go, go into the effects of African Americans past and present. So the Black Code codes, because, because of the way they were structured, they led to the following. So the beginnings of the prison industrial complex, and then, then um, they also led to the exploitation of Black labor and lowering of, of Black wages. And they also led to the implementation of white patriarchal heteronormative standards. And so with the beginning of the um, prison industrial complex, it's a system with that in which the government and corporations collaborate to use prisons and other industries for profit. And so like in, so an example of this is, um, how in Georgia they used convict labor to build a lot of the public works such as, such as the roads. And so my resources for, for this section um, were the article Legacies of the Racialization and Incarceration from Convict Lease to the Prison Industrial Complex by A. E. Raza. Um, and then I also used the ebook, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness by Michelle Alexander. And so here, here we are back, back to that loophole, right? So the 13th Amendment outlawed slavery. However, that loophole said specifically, except as punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. So layman's terms is that they could use slavery as a form of punishment against criminals. However, they, they never defined what the crime was. And so the black codes were defining crime along lines of race through laws dealing with vagrancy, labor contracts and employment. And so, and so continuing on, before emancipation, um, prison was used for mostly white people. Afterwards, the prison system adapted to conscript mostly freed African Americans into forced labor through the Black Codes. And so the prison housing conditions were akin to those during slavery. For example, um, when W.B. Du Bois was doing a study of, of prisons in Georgia, he found that, that many of them didn't have a hospital, a doctor, or a chaplain, even though they were required by law. Under the Black Codes, a convict labor could be leased out for the following reasons. The South was in an economic depression after the Civil War, and um, the, st the states um, wholly endorsed it because um, not on only do they did they have a sizable supply of cheap labor through the prisoners, um, they could use their labor to boost their profits to pay back some of the debts they incurred during the Civil War. And so the vagrancy laws from the Black Codes and Jim, Jim Crow transformed in the latter part of the 20th century to imprison even more Black people. So um, this, this transformed into like the war on crime under Lyndon Johnson in the 1960s. Um, and then, then that transformed later into the war on drugs under Richard Nixon in the 1970s. And it kept carried through like several um, other presidential terms. Um, it, uh, it, it kind of lessened um, when Obama signed the Fair Sen Sentencing Act in 2010, but the more or less the war on drugs is, is still being fought to this day, just not as intensely. Um, and so the, the war on drugs um, 
when, when Richard Nixon um, declared that he formed the Drug Enforcement Agency in 1973, and initially it had 1,470 agents and a budget of less than $75 million. Today, however, it has nearly 5,000 agents with a budget of $2.3 million. So, so it's it's almost three times what it's almost three times the budget it was in 1973, but it's um almost th yeah it's m a little over three times um what it, what the number of agents was in 1973. And so Ronald Reagan expanded these policies with like mandatory tory, uh, sentences for um, specific drug offenses. So if you were caught with like um, crack cocaine, I forget get the um. The, the actual amount you had to have, you could get um, five years. But if you you had pirate cocaine, you would get, get an even um, uh, uh, softer sentence. And so, so Eric D. Larson compared a 1960 uh, study of incarceration rates to an, a 2010 study. And in 2010, he found that black people were incarcerated at four times the rate they were in the 1960s. And, and Michelle Alexander in her book of New Jim Crow, um, she, she um, posits that we, there are more black people incarcerated today than there were um, during slavery. And, and so we also have the, with with the black codes, we also have the exploitation of labor, and so, so for this, I use the following resources. So I use the article "Southern Labor Law: Exploitative or Competitive" by Jennifer Roback. Um, I use another article, "Separate and Unequal in the Labor Market: um, uh, Human Capital and the Jim Crow Wage Gap" by Celeste K. Carruthers and Marianne H. Wanamaker. And finally, I used another article, Black Lives, um, Ma Ma Black Lives Matter in Building Bridges. I'm sorry, Black Lives Matter in Bridge Building, Labor Education for a New Jim Crow Era by Eric D. Larson. OK, and con continuing on. So because of the restrictions of the, the Black Codes, most Black, black um, people had to go back to their, their farm master's plantations, right? And so this time when they went back, they had to sign contracts, these yearly contracts, right? And with these contracts, um, wages were paid over the lifespan of the contract, right? And they were paid higher wages um, around different times of the season because the contracts were based around um, um, agriculture and planting season, right? So, so the close, so for example, the the closer it, it was to harvest, the more you would get paid. And if it wasn't close to harvest, the less you would get paid. However, um, the, the workers, um, they, they need, needed advances on their wages to live, right? So because they, they needed advances, they were always indebted to their employer. And there was a perceived con to this, this system of yearly contracts, right? Because um, the employers um, believed that all the workers had to do was breach contract before for the harvest, so they could just take their money and run, um, and and they wouldn't have to come back. So they, by 1867, alternative contracts um, were widely used, and two two of those form, um, two of those that were mainly used were sharecropping contracts and rental contracts. And so this this is I'm about to explain to you why sharecropping was an, another form of slavery. Um, so the worker planted crops and they kept a small percentage, usually about a quarter and a half for themselves when the their employer sold the crop at market. And the advances were, were further deducted from that share if, if they needed advances. However, um, the employer, um, they provided fertilizer, mules, and equipment for, for uh, planting crops. And that could also be deducted from your, um, from your share. So, so you're, you're gi giving, a, a, you're, you're doing all, all the work, but the, 
but the employer is reaping all the benefits just just as in slavery. And then we're going on to rental contracts where a tenant could pay a fixed price for the land they worked. Um, it could be a fixed dollar amount or just a, a fixed share of the crop. Um, so that made the tenant responsible for the failure or success of the crop. And so, so, so either way, uh, um, employers believed through these contracts, the the uh, uh, the planter or I'm sorry, the worker was uh, further incentivized to stay on the plantation or on on the farm because they had a, a more vested share in the crop. And then continuing on, um, so after the, the the black codes, the Jim Crow laws continued the de facto segregation of the school system. And so African Americans can couldn't receive the same quality education as white people. And so so because because that they, they could couldn't um, receive that same quality education, they, they weren't receiving a, a lot of a lot of the uh, same skills training as white people. So therefore you ha have um, not a lot of highly skilled African American workers, which led to a, a racialized wage gap. According to a work paper by Carruthers and Wanamaker, uh, in eight, 1940, white people earned 25 to 32 percent more than African Americans. And as the 20th century continued, the separate but equal policies of Jim Crow and, and the Black Codes uh, translated into the economic gap between um, Blacks and whites. So. So you have more mortgage policies and highway constructions, which provided opportunities for class mobility and equity growth for white workers. However, um, black workers didn't get those same advantages. Um, what, what worked for them, what worked for, um, sorry, white white workers didn't work the same for black workers because, because of those mortgage policies and the, that highway construction, uh, it pushed black workers into poor, poorly poor areas that didn't have um, the best funded hospitals nor the best funded schools. And even if, um, even as they, they gained uh, uh, access to unions, um, seniority policies within those unions and job segregation kept them in low paying positions. And today there, there are inequities in still in black neighborhoods, um, especially with regard to heavy policing. And you, you don't even have support from like the labor unions because um, uh, a lot of labor unions have remained, remained silent in, in their um, on issues with Black Lives Matter. Um, for instance, um, when Mike Ferguson was killed, um, I found research that that stated that um, a lot of the late labor un unions re remained silent and discouraged any anyone from speaking on their behalf. And so they, there we're going to um, the implementation of white patriarchal heteronormative standards. And for, for this, I use the following resources. So aberrations in black, um, toward a queer critique by noted que black queer um, theorist Roderick A. Ferguson, and then I used another article um, <laughs> that you used in, in the previous section, Black Lives Matter and Building Bridges, um, Labor Education for New Jim Crow Era by Eric D. Larson. And so before emancipation, slaves could exist in like non-monogamous and sexually fluid relationships. No one, no one really cared. However, with the Black, black Codes um, implemented after uh, emancipation, uh, marriages were regulated as between a Black man and a Black woman. Those African Americans who did not adhere were imprisoned and denied their pension. And so you, you have the connection um, between queer, queerness and, um, well, the denial of queerness and um, this patriarchal view of labor, right? And, and uh, of relationships. Um, 
And today, today a, a lot of these heteronormative standards, uh, such a, as uh, uh, marriage um, and such such as on labor, uh, have led to the death of many LGBT folk. Um, a black person's life is taken by a police officer or a vigilante every 28 hours, and a black trans person's life expectancy is 35 years. And I want, want to also add, um, because of these heteronormative standards, um, trans folk who are who are sex workers can be arrested uh, for walking while trans because that there are uh, several laws on the books um, that 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 um, let police just arrest them for for wa walking um, just just for for walking if they believe they are sex workers. And, uh, and these all these heteronormative standards have also led to discrimination in housing um, and in environmental contamination for black LGBT folk. And then, then just continuing on for women under the, the Black Codes and Jim Crow, um, they were relegated to work on the plantation and later domestic workers. As such, they did not receive many of the protection protections under the law, such as mothers' pensions for for widows, um, for most of the 20th century. Today, even lab there are labor law exemptions that still went render black women unprotected. And under Jim Crow, um, black women were deemed unwomanly because their wa waged work included what would be defined as men's work, such as lifting heavy materials. And but during the the Reagan, the, I'm sorry, the Reagan era, when they decided to pursue like unwaged work as mothers in their own home and seek government assistance, they were paying as welfare queens um, who just just wanted to um, exploit the system. And so now we're co coming back. How does this connect to my play, right? And so my play looks at two queer black men, Jacoby and Remus, camped out in a cotton field. And so my play mixes history um, with it, even just within this relationship, because Jacoby is a contemporary urbanite, and Remus appears to be a slave from the late 19th century. The two men have opposing goals. So Jacoby wants to stop their, their journey to wait on Hippolyta so he can get wings to get away from Remus, uh, um, and specifically Remus and his stories because he feels that they are oppressive. Um, and Remus wants to go further into the field because because that's what they've done, and he just wants to continue on that path. So unable to reach a decision, they just, they decide to sleep on it. But when they awake, they are visited by Conjure Chestnut and his disciples, Timmons, Banjo, Augustine, and Gethsemane. Conjure advises Jacoby and Remus to avoid Hippolyta but they're, and remain where they are. So, so the question I'm asking throughout this place, can they trust um, what Conjure is offering and can they trust his crew? So how this this um, relates back to the Black Codes is Conjure's following followers seem to be affected by the Black Codes. They all refer to conditions um, for Blacks after the Civil War. And for one thing, Banjo um, has been in prison for vagrancy. And Augustine, his wife, could only find work on, the, on a plantation after the Civil War for a time. And Gethsemane allowed her body to be used for medical experiments to avoid imprisonment um, be because um, she couldn't find work anywhere else. Um, with, with these characters, my play is also mixing times, so, so it's connecting um, the, the modern Black experience to the 1860s because um, Banjo's term of imprisonment seems like hundreds a hundred, if not hundreds of years, um, because that represents the the fact that vagrancy um, vagrancy laws were used in Jim Crow and the Black Codes, and they tra transformed um, into different policies throughout the 20th and 21st centuries. And Augustine works as a farmhand in the 1860s and a civil rights worker in the 1960s. And the experiments on Gethsemane correspond to those uh, performed on African Americans throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. So, as the Black Coast created a system to steal free Blacks' physical labor, Conjure reveals himself to be a thief of souls. 
Um, and and when Hippolyta comes, um, she she awards um, she she awards Remus the wings instead of um, Jacoby. So so that that goes to show like the Black Codes defined blackness as a crime. My play says blackness is queer connected tradition and ever evolving. And and so in my play that is um, that is represented through Remus and Remus as a storyteller and Remus as a queer man and Remus as, as someone who is always looking um, to expand his his knowledge and, and he's not just one thing. Um, and when and when um, when uh, uh, sorry when Jacoby is, is trying to get away from that he's trying to get a, get away from blackness in a way uh, the, the definition of blackness is queer and connected and uh, connected to tradition and ever evolving um, and and so by punishing him and um, giving and having Hippolyta give the wings to Remus instead of him, what I'm saying is um, not not having the definition of blackness as queer, as as connected to tradition and ever evolving is the, really the true crime. Uh, um, and that that ends my presentation, you you guys. I have I have my um, email listed. Um, if we can't answer any questions today, I'd be glad to. Um, to, to email you back. Any further questions? Thanks so much, Ivan. Yeah, we're going to open it up to audience questions now, so you feel free to type your question in the chat or raise your hand. Thank you, Ivan, for that presentation. It was very informative and interesting. Uh, my name's Kelly, I work in the library, and I have a question for you while other people are typing out their questions. Um, what was the most surprising thing you learned in your historical research? Uh, most surprising thing? Um, uh, um, um, well, the most surprising thing, thing I, I learned is that um, th there is, is still a lot of um, research to be done into to how um, the, the Black co Codes um, affected queer women, and, well, queer people and, and Black women. And I, I feel it's out there, um, and I definitely want to um, pursue that in the future. Um, as as I I am doing more research um, for this play. Thank you. That's that's very interesting. Yeah, I hope we're on the verge of a lot more of understanding yeah. a lot more of that. Okay, since other people are still typing, I have another question, so I'm just going to yes. log the mic here. Uh, yes. so what, <laughs> what advice might you give to a fellow student, you know, wanting to use historical research to inform their creative process? What would you tell them to do? Hmm. So, so what I would t tell them to do, um, find 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 a, a subject librarian for, for um, that that's specific to what you want to, um, what 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 you want to research and what you want to pursue. Um, first first off, um, but but then then once you, once you you have that research, immediately <laughs> immediately read it. Um, but but also um, give that research some time to. Some 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 time to to fester in your mind, um, and 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 so um, so when when you're giving it time to fester, you're giving it time to transform, um, and you're you're giving it time time to not only transform um, um, into theme, but you're giving it time to transform into character, um, and specifically which char character it applies to, um, and the decisions that they make, and also um, it it also um, guides plot, right? Um, yeah, it also guides plot um, because um, because because I I did, didn't um, I did didn't know um, uh, 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 banjo was 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 going to um, 
was was going going to re react the way way he did until, until I I found out um, that um, they 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 imprisoned people f for um, vagrancy and that that they also um, they they also further disenfranchised them um, even after they they uh, uh, even after they were released from from. Um, from from imprisonment through like things like, like voting laws and grand grandfather poll taxes. So, so yeah, just 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 give it time to to fester, and well, not fester, but transform is a better word for it. Fest fester has has, has negative connotations. Thank you. You're welcome. So I think we still have a couple of questions coming in in the chat. Um, Stephen wrote, uh, he's interested to know how you launch from research to the creative process, which I think you already touched on. Uh, but he also says he, he's not researched uh, a ton for plays himself and is curious about how research uh, shows up um, in the text when you're creating a play. Um, did you want to add anything more to the answer that you just gave, Kelly? Or I, we've got another question in the chat that I can move on to if you feel like. Uh, say, say that one more time. Um, he's interested to know how you move from the research process to the creative process. Oh, OK. Yeah, man. man. Yeah, man, man. Like, like I said, said you, you have to, you have to sleep, but but also um, Yes, yes, sleep on it. Um, let, let it transform. But but then then also in a more specific way, ask your yourself um, as, as you are. As you are um, sleeping on it and, and letting it transform, um, what character does this apply to? And and not only that, um, how does it result into action specific to that character? Um, and 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 what what it, and what is this the saying about the research that that I, I have so far? Does that make sense? Uh, uh, that's a big yes, yes. <laughs> So we have another question from uh, Miriam Intratour. She says, thanks for the fascinating presentation, Ivan. Yay, um, I, really I really appreciate how you laid out the library sources you used throughout your talk. Is there any information you really wanted or hoped to find but could not? Uh, for example, a resource that seems not to exist or has not been, have not been kept. Uh. Mm, okay. Huh. I yeah I I want to find um um and and we we it, it's just we we didn't we 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 uh, yeah I I want to find find more information on um on on con, con, um, conditions uh, and uh. More, more information on um, homonormative um, relationships within within the antebellum South. Um, it's, it's out there. I, I just just um, just just didn't ha happen upon it yet. I know, know it's out, out there because because we, we found some things. I just just want more, and I, I'm curious about um, more um, more um, resources, um, more resources, and, and I'm go going to look them um, because. Uh, uh, Lorraine, Lorraine, shout out to Lorraine again. She also get, gave me resources um, in in that area as, as well. Um, well, she, she she gave me some starting resources in that area. But but also, uh, I'm I'm also so curious to um to look look into um to like what are um to uh sorry 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 my, my mind's blanking right now um to, i'm i'm also interested in like what are um um mothers pensions and um 
why specifically weren't they they given to black women? Um, and, and what what were the benefits of of those pensions? Um, and how long they they could could last? You usually for for white women. Um, and, and were were they, were they enough, enough to so that they they didn't work? Um, is 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 that that what? Because I, 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 I know it's also because because um, black women um, during Jim Crow weren't perceived as motherly. Um, but what what were the benefits of it for white women and how and um, and like what what were the benefits of, of it for white women? But also. Um, like 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 I said, how how long did it did it last? Um, what do they usually spend it on? Um, did did it did it did it did it help them raise children? Um, and if if so, um, what 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 was the need, still the need need for for black labor and and all that? So so yeah, I, I'm I'm really interested in, in that as well. So yeah. And then, then I'm also interested in these uh, labor law exemptions and how they're not not protecting black women. I, I want to look at that more for, for the modern day component of it anyway. Thanks for that answer, Ivan. Uh, we've got one more question in the chat. Uh, so Janalee is wondering uh, if, if, hey, you think if any of the area prisons would allow you to bring your play uh, into the, the walls of the prison um and do, are there plans for the play to be presented here once restrictions are lifted okay so the second question uh, oh, that, that that's easier to, to to answer um so uh i don't know uh, specifically um um they're they're saying saying we're going to do do in person uh, classes and, and everything um but but right now I'm I'm not sure um, as as to if if they will be restricted I mean lifted for the um, for for the theater program and when those restrictions are lifted then that's when um, uh, I will be be able to do do um, stuff in person. However, um, if, if they're they're not, um, we're we're still still going to do it. Um, for play fest so so how that that process is going to work um is that that we'll get get three developmental readings um throughout out next year as, as a third year i will and then and then so sometime uh in in the fall we're, we're going to start casting it um and and then then um i believe at that time, I'll also be assigned a director, or or I'll look for a director myself. My um, my my preference is to have a black director, um, because because I, I really really um, want want to give black directors a chance, but but also um, I, I'm intent on, on forming relationships with with black artists, um, because I, I want to return back to um, black theater, um. But move, moving on from that, um, well, once 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 we we've got the director and we've we've got that cast, um, and about late late March next year, we're going to start rehearsals, um, and and then um, we we will do we will start presenting the play like that second or third week week in April. Um, so so either it will be in person, and if it's in person. Um, it will either be in Kantner or the radio broadcast building. Um, and if if it's online or, or Zoom, I'm fine with that that as well. Uh, um, and and then uh, as part of Playfest, we will also have um, mentors. Um, I, I'm rearing for for all, all three mentors to be black this time because I got I got lucky this time as well. Um, but but yeah yeah that that will be the process process um for for the play going forward for next year um to to inc include it in the theatrical calendar, but um will will it be be performed in prisons? Uh, I haven't thought I haven't thought of that yet, um and I haven't thought of how to make make that happen, uh home because I don't see a, a lot of magical because it's also magical realist, um and. and and a little bit surrealist, um, so so I, I haven't 
see, seen a lot of, lot, I haven't heard of a lot of those plays being performed in prisons. Is is more usually, um, more more like, uh, well, Shakespeare's been performed in prison, so. So so now that I think that that you can never never say never, um, but but yeah, um, on a personal level, I I haven't I haven't thought about that yet. Uh, to, to make a long story short, and thank you though, thank you. I will dream big in the future. Thank you. I'm gonna take your advice. I think we might have one more question coming in from Lorraine. So send all the questions you want to. Want to. <laughs> Come on, y'all. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. Ah, just thank you so much. So I think uh, we're probably uh, going to go ahead and wrap it up at this point. Ivan, on behalf of the libraries, I want to thank you so much for the wonderful presentation and for your research. Um, and thank you for sharing it with us. I am recording today's um, presentation and it will be available on the library's YouTube channel. Thank you all so very, very much for spending a little bit of time with us this afternoon. Yes, Have a great you. day. Bye, guys. Thank, yeah, th thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Kaylee.